Hi everyone and welcome back to my War Games Hobby Channel. Well, today I'm going to do something completely different, just for a change. And that is, um, about a month ago, uh, two friends and myself, we visited a local battlefield and went on a battlefield tour, just the three of us, not a part of anything else. Um, we live in North East Hampshire and about an hour's drive away from here to the south, uh, to the east of Winchester, is the battlefield of Cheriton, which of course, as you know, is, is um, a battle from the English Civil War, which took, uh, took place in 1644. And what we did was we, we walked around what we thought was part of the battlefield, and, and we, we probably were in the right place, but. There seems to be some sort of um, uh, controversies to exactly uh, which fields down there the battle took place. I think I'd better explain. <laughs> when, we, um, when we went there, we, we saw on the map where the battlefield was and we walked around various fields to get a feel of the whole thing. It was actually quite an eye-opener, really, as to... Um, how much the, I wouldn't say it was a hilly area down there, but there are some hills um, and, and even a little sort of hill can sometimes hide movement of troops and it makes you realise when you're standing in a field with hedges and trails and small slopes, how much can be hidden from view. You sometimes got a very limited uh, amount of view. And one of the big controversies uh, is exactly where the battle took place. We know it took place between the village of Cheriton and Cheriton Wood, which is to the east. In fact, part of the battle was in Cheriton Wood. Uh, but the main battle took place between the, the village and, and the wood. Now here's an aerial view of, of the battlefield and you can see Cheriton there to the left and you've got the edge of the uh, Cheriton Wood to the right, and then a place which is now called North, North End, which is a farm, which wasn't there at the time, at, at, in, in 1644. But you can see uh, roughly where the battlefield was. Now, if you look at my next picture, I've, I've added some details there, um, because you'll see there's a green line that runs through um, the middle of the battlefield and that's the top of a slope that's a sort of a hill that runs along along that um, there's a, a footpath in fact which has got hedges either side and you can see the hedges there just above where I've marked um, the the hill the slope and when you're on that um, in your, on that track in fact here's a here's a little video that explains a little bit more about that that's Cheriton Wood in distance we're walking along a path that's along a ridge where the centre of the battlefield is. To the left is where the Royalists would have come up from this dip in the ground here, from that ridge over there. Cheriton Wood, there was a fight in Cheriton Wood where Royalists pushed some parliamentarians out of that wood. And now we're walking along this ridge and to the right, Path through this hedge here, there's another field, is where the parliamentarians were. So you can see that the, um, it's not difficult to actually see over those hedges. Now, the, it, it, it is fair to say that the battlefield hasn't changed a great deal uh, over the last sort of three, 300, 350 years, although the hedges might be slightly bigger. It, there was a, it was a fact that the hedges and the tracks did impede uh, movement of infantry and especially cavalry. And you can see when we were walking along um, these tracks what the problem was. Now we walked along that line, virtually along that green line, along that track, and you can see roughly in the middle where the, uh, another line goes, another track goes down. We walked down that track as well and here's here's another quick video of us walking down that track We're walking down this uh, pathway to the right is where we believe Bard and his Royalist regiment attacked uh, the parliamentarians down this slope they would have come from we believe up the slope going downhill and this is the path which would have been to his left 
because there is comment on cavalry not being able to assist Barb because of uh, they had to go down sort of narrow hedged paths and I think this is a pretty good idea of what they were up against. They couldn't actually get to um, assist Bard in his attack because there were hedges in the way. Now, I'm not saying that this is exactly how it would have looked 350 years ago, but if these paths did exist then, and it sounds like from the description of the battle that they did, that it's not so different to what we're finding now that the cavalry couldn't get through to actually help Bard. And in the end, he got uh, badly beaten. And the cavalry, um, when they did finally get into the open, uh, couldn't do much to help. And they were then pushed back anyway. So this is quite a steep slope, actually, heading down towards where the parliamentarian forces would have been. So as I say, to the right is a big field. And we believe that's where Bard and his regiment failed to beat the parliamentarians and got soundly beaten himself when he was charged probably on his flank by Hasserig's cavalry. Yeah, so looking at this map, we think we are, we've just walked down here. There's a, there's a pathway with hedges either side. So we've just walked down there. So to our right, in this field, which I can't get up into there because it's too steep for me, where Neil and Alan are. That's where we believe Bard came through with his troops to attack the parliamentarians. And if you look back on the map, so we're about sort of here. Where all the action is really. And you can see the problem that the, the cavalry would have had. We do believe that these paths that were, were in existence then, and the cavalry couldn't actually get onto the battlefield. So, um, that's where we are, roughly there. So you can see the problem. You know, it really is quite a high hedge. Now, what I've done is I've placed what I feel... Um, well, that's generally accepted where the evening before, the day before, when troops arrived, um, the, the Royalist Army under Forth and Hopton, which I'll explain a bit in a minute why there's two commanders mentioned, but the Royalist Army formed up roughly where you can see I've got them at the moment, and the Parliamentarians formed up south of that. Roughly, roughly where they are now. In fact, and that is generally accepted where those two armies were formed up. One of the problems we have is that if you look at the what the council placed at um, observation sort of area, if you go to the battlefield, you go to the north of the map. Roughly, if you look on on the map, um, it's roughly where where Hopton is, slightly um, the, the the end of the of, of the blue line. I put there's another little sort of junction isn't there and that's where that sort of monument is now if you look at that monument which i've got a picture of here you can see that um the royalists are where we're standing but that the parliamentarians were started off back on the road which is now the a272 um just to the south of uh, hinton apna which isn't on that feature on that map um and it 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 indicates that the, the parliamentarians moved from that position up to East Down, which is the, the path that we just walked along, the upper Lambra Lane, and that the Royalists tried to attack uphill um, towards that. Well, I think it's wrong, <laughs> to be honest. And in fact, it is generally accepted now that, in fact, that's not quite right. Although no one knows absolutely for sure but shortly I'm going to explain to you why I think the opposite was the case. In fact, that the, the Royalists were up on um, East Down, up on that upper Lambda Lane, and that the, the Parliamentarians stayed down on the road, or near the road, just near um, Hinton Apna, and didn't 
uh, come forward very much at all until they were attacked by the royalists. Now, the reason I say that is because there's evidence to prove that is the case. And I'll go through that evidence in a, in a minute with you. But first of all, let's, let's look back um, a little bit as to why both armies ended up there. In uh, the year before, in 1643, um, Lord Ralph Hopton had been very successful in expanding his influence of the Royalists in southwest England. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that now, but it's fair to say that he gave uh, William Waller a bit of a runaround, really, and, uh, and that was the height of the sort of Royalist uh, situation in England at the end of 1643. And William Waller and Hopton uh, faced each other on more than one occasion, and they were great friends, in fact. They both served in the Thirty Years' War and continued to uh, write to each other throughout the English Civil War. Um, but the king in Oxford, his capital at the time, decided he wanted to uh, expand his influence in the south of England and, th and threaten London from the south. So he wanted uh, Lord Hopton to, in early 1644, to do that. But likewise, the parliamentarians wanted to um, increase their influence in South East England because they held Portsmouth, um, they held Plymouth, although most of the rest of the countryside was under royalist control. They held Farnham, and, uh, but Winchester was under royalist control, uh, as was Old Basing. So they decided they would move, uh, that they, they wanted William Waller to move his armies southwest and um, make sure that uh, the royalists didn't expand further. So t t both armies were, were bound to meet in battle at some point. Uh, the, the royalists ended up near Olsford, uh, just to the south of Olsford, and um, the parliamentarians started to move further southwest and they ended up facing each other and the battle site that we have now. So the, the night before, that's on the, the 28th, both armies, armies settled down. The Royalists under Patrick Reuven, or Lord Forth as he's known, and, and Lord Ralph Hopton. The reason why they had two commanders was because the King, wanting to expand in the south, the southwest and the south of England, knew that Hopton's army on its own wouldn't be enough, so he he sent forth with some Oxford, uh, some of the Oxford army south to join Hopton. Oddly enough, um, Lord Forth was the commander in chief of the Royalists' armies in England, and you would think he would take over command, but Hopton had been so successful, I think it's quite likely the king probably didn't want to sort of upset him and send someone down to take over his command. I don't know what they both felt about this, Hopton and, um, and, the, and Lord Forth. Lord Forth had no option. He was told by the king that they would jointly command uh, the army down there. Um, whether they both were happy with that or whether they both agreed, with, I don't know. There's, there's no documentation that I've discovered anyway. So the armies were facing each other and the Royalist armies formed up, let's say, on that ridge, on my map, which is to the north of that main hill in the middle. Now, one of the reasons I'm to you that I believe that the Royalists actually went up east down and formed up on the, on the upper Lambra Lane was this. Now, where they are on the map, my map, which I'm showing you now, that is, a, that is high ground, but it's not as high as the uh, east down. Uh, the upper Lambda Lane area that we walked along. And so I wouldn't think that they'd consider that as strong a position as, as the, if the parliamentarians were up uh, um, east down, uh, they'd be a little bit concerned about that, but they weren't. They were, they were happy that they, had, they held the high ground and that if the parliamentarians wanted to attack, they have to come to them. Which wouldn't make sense if they were in the starting positions as they are on the map because the parliamentarians would have the high ground and they would be very happy to stay there and let the royalists attack them. But they didn't. They were in a disadvantaged position, and I believe down by the road. 
The other reason I say that is because William Waller decided to occupy Cheriton Wood and that evening they sent uh, 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 some London trained bands into Cheriton Wood and occupied it. So next morning on the 29th of March when Hopton arose he discovered with horror that Cheriton Wood had been occupied and he did actually state at the time that there was a big concern because they threatened the left flank of the Royalist army. Now if the Royalists were down on Titchbourne Down, which is the north of the map, they're, they're, yes, Cheriton Wood is on their left if they should advance, but if they didn't advance, which they had no intention to at the moment, they were, they were in a defended position, it wouldn't be a problem, would it? So I don't know why he would then be concerned that they were threatening the left flank of the Royalist army. So he decided to retake it. The parliamentarians, incidentally, if they were up on East Down, um, it would be an obvious thing for them to take that wood. But if it was attacked, they should be able to support it quite well if they were up on East Down. But I don't believe they were. I think they were down on, on, along Cheriton Lane or, or along the, the old the A272. Right, so that's the first thing. The wood wouldn't be a problem if the Royalists were on Titchbourne Down. I think they were on the East Down and obviously that in that is then a problem. Why he didn't occupy it first of all I don't know. Maybe his entire army wasn't up there. Maybe it was encamped along between uh, Titchbourne Down and East Down and then suddenly um, it was occupied and it was a problem. Straight away he, um, he ordered an attack to uh, clear the wood which didn't get on too well initially uh, because it was being defended quite well but in the end he, he sent uh, some troops around the flank and attacked it from the other side and did clear the wood and then once happy um, that that had happened he wanted in fact the London train bands fell back in some disarray back towards the parliamentarian line which again isn't clear where they mean by that but it wouldn't be along East Down I wouldn't have thought it would be um, back towards where I believe the Parliament line was. Hopton decided at this point that maybe it would be a good thing to continue chasing them and try and turn the right flank of the uh, parliamentarians. And he indicated to um, Lord Forth that's maybe a good thing to do. But Lord Forth uh, um, said, no, uh, we're in a very strong position here why don't we just stay put and if they want to attack us they can come to us and we have the advantage of ground and apparently Lord Hopton agreed with that. I, I suppose you could see that they were in a very strong position if they were up on East Down and they now occupied Cheriton Wood as well. It's a very strong position and, and, and the parliamentarians would have a difficult job attacking uphill, up a slope, um, towards uh, East Down, up, up towards Upper Lambourne Lane. So I can clearly see why uh, Lord Forth and Hopton decided that, yeah, you know, this is a, a good position to hold, so we'll stay here. If the parliamentarians had been up there instead, uh, they would have been very concerned about Cheriton would falling to the Royalists again, could it be, be on their right flank? They would have made more effort to take it back. The fact that they didn't indicates that they were further down the hill. Right, so that's, that's the reason, I think, that the battle did take place not between Titchbourne Down and East Down, it took place the main battle between East Down, the top of the slope, down towards the A272 or just in front, in front of the village of Hinton Apna. Right, so there we are, there's the, there's the position we've got. Um, oh, let's talk about numbers now. Uh, the, the Royalists, uh, seemingly, there's, there's various um, reports on how many men both sides had but it's generally accepted that the royalists had somewhere between sort of seven and nine thousand men so we'll make it we'll take middle ground here let's only had eight thousand men that's about uh, four thousand foot and about the same amount of cavalry about four thousand cavalry that's the royalist army uh the but william waller's parliamentarian had slight numerical superiority they had between five and seven thousand foot and between three and a half and 
5,000 cavalry. So let's just, again, take an average uh, that they had about 5,500 infantry as against the 4,000 royalists and a similar amount of cavalry as the royalists had, about 4,000. But they did have a number of dragoons as well. Various reports say between five and 800 dragoons. So they had about 10,000 men against 8,000. So a, a, a significant advantage in numbers. Although it is fair to say that the Royalist army were probably better quality uh, because a large part of the um, Parliamentarian army were made, made up of London train bands. And the London train bands weren't that keen to be where they were. They were raised to keep London safe. And whenever they were used uh, elsewhere, they were a little bit reluctant. So William Waller knew he had sort of some, a large part of his army. Although they were well trained, they were still reluctant, which may well be why they were pushed out of um, short wood so easily. So <clears throat> the two armies facing each other, 8,000 royalists, I believe, on East Down, on the slope or behind the slope. So having had his success in removing the parliamentarians from, from Cheriton Wood, it was agreed that they would now hold the line and let the parliamentarians come to them. Right, now at this point, Hopton decided to go and converse with uh, Lord Forth in person. So as he was riding along the ridge, he, he did with horror, and I'll read out an extract from a book <clears throat> that I've been reading, or various extracts, but this, this one explains it quite well. So when he was riding over to consult with Forth, um, being near the midway point along the brow of the hill, he saw troops on the right wing too far advanced and hotly engaged with the enemy in the foot of the hill. So here's another good reason why, in fact, um, the Royalists weren't fighting uphill, they were going down the slope towards the Parliamentarians. So all the more reason why um, the battle took place between East Down and Hinton Apna. Um, so hotly engaged with the enemy at the foot of the hill and hard pressed. And when he came to Lord Brentford, he found him in much trouble with it. Um, for he seems the engagement was by the forwardness of some particular officers without order. Okay, that's one thing. We'll come to that in a minute. But uh, another uh, eyewitness account said that um, they were ordered to fall on both wings, Which for then the enemy finds most of our strength drawn off the hill into the bottom, where Sir Henry Bard leading of his regiment further than he had orders for. So, orders were given to advance. Why was that? Why on earth did Forth decide to attack? And he didn't tell Hopton that he was going to do this, he just went off and did it himself. I've heard a lot of various bits on the internet and various books, and um, there's various opinions on this, but no one really knows for sure. But it was generally felt that he, having Hop seeing Hopton having success in the wood, he felt that maybe if they just pushed a little bit from the other flank, it would encourage the parliamentarians to, to, to leave, to go away. And it, so it seems likely that he ordered uh, the advance of some of his regiments. We don't know how many, there's no mention of numbers. But one of those regiments was Bard's regiment and he was down there facing what he thought was a, not the largest part of the parliamentarian army. The fact is though, when you're down there and I've stood roughly where I think the attack took place and there's another video which I'll show you in a minute which explains that, what happened. But when he was down there, he probably really couldn't see too much. Um, there's, there is a dip in the ground, there's another little slope, and a lot of the parliamentarians would have been behind the ridge. The other thing was that some of his troops set fire to a barn down there. They were getting fired upon from the hedges and they were taking losses. So they set fire to this barn in the hope that the smoke would, you know, give them a bit of cover, maybe. I don't know. But what happened was this, 
the wind changed and the smoke came back in the faces of the, the Royalist forces there. So they were being shot at from behind hedges. They couldn't reply very much. And Bard um, suddenly realised that um, he had taken on probably more than he could chew. But worse was to come because the smoke, um, which was now coming towards them, meant that they couldn't really see on the flank. And a large force of parliamentarian cavalry under Hasselrig, including Hasselrig's um, cuirassiers, went round the flank and hit Bard's regiment from behind. And it was a very, very quick battle. Uh, they were virtually uh, wiped out to a man. So it was an absolute disaster. Now, whether, whether Bard um, went too far, whether he was ordered to go further, I don't know. It certainly, I can understand his position from, from the point of view as he probably couldn't see that he was advancing on half the parliamentarian army. Uh, if they were hidden from view, and especially once the smoke from the burning barn uh, hid it even more, he found himself into a very difficult position. There has been some comments that there were other troops there as well, and he advanced to secure their flank, but there's no mention of them being attacked by the cavalry, so that, that's a little bit confusion, confusing. So Bard basically got his regiment was destroyed very, very quickly. And this boosted the morale of the parliamentarians and, of course, dented the morale of the, all the royalists. And then I think what happened was the, the uh, Lord Forth decided he had to go and, went saying, seeing this happen, sent down reinforcements, sent down more infantry, and um, with, maybe with some, some cavalry support to try and uh, retrieve the situation. But the damage had been done. So, unfortunately, um, things went from bad to worse after that. One of the problems the Royalists had was to get troops deployed enough to get into a fight, which would have been to their advantage had they stayed on top of the hill. But they didn't. They were going down the hill towards the parliamentarian line. And there were these hedges, and you can see on the map, there are various lanes that go down. You can send troops down there, but you can't just come straight off. You have to wait for there's a gap in the fence or the hedge before you get onto a field. And there was a problem in deploying properly, especially for the cavalry. The cavalry had no ends of trouble trying to deploy. And there have been various accounts of that, uh, where the, the Royalist cavalry just could not deploy in time to be effective. Whereas the parliamentarians were down there already and it was easy for them to deploy. So the Royalists were attacking and they were doing exactly what they didn't want to do. What they wanted the parliamentarians to do was to attack them up the hill. They were now trying to attack them down the hill. That's Hinton Ampner in the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where the parliamentarian line was and it moved across, we believe, through that wood probably wouldn't have been there then. It would have been more open. They would be coming across there and then turning back there's the lane we've just walked through and the royalists would have been up this slope and we believe bard came attacked down this hill towards where the parliamentarians were either where i'm standing or probably the other side other side of that field near the, near the where the trees are now so we believe this is where bard attacked and um Hasserig, Has, the Hasserig cavalry came across here and they probably had more access to this part of the battlefield than the Royalist cavalry did, which were in fact up the hill, near where Neil and uh, Alan are now, to the right. Maybe they were impeded a bit more uh, than Hasserig was. So if they got to this position, with a regiment of infantry fighting parliamentarians to the front and then suddenly from this direction a mass of Hasserig heavy cavalry hit them in the flank where they wouldn't have been very happy and the royalists weren't able to probably save them it's possible that this hedge was still here maybe not as big as it is now but that might have impeded any hope of the royalist cavalry coming to the aid of Bard's infantry because that's where, that's the direction that Hasserig would have attacked from. 
they might have been uh, that, that tree line there near the road might well have not been as big so yeah we, we believe this is where a lot of the action took place on the right flank of the royalist army and led to uh, the battle being lost in fact because that move by Bard was a mistake he committed he was supposed to be defending I think the royalist intended to defend turned around a bit more to defend that ridge behind us but he uh, got a bit impetuous and went forward with his regiment and got badly beaten he was badly wounded lost an arm I believe so yes it was a bit of an error he exposed himself he probably didn't realize I'll imagine coming down here that Hauserig had cavalry might have been hidden because it's pretty obvious when you look around this battlefield the slopes and the hedges would have obscured a lot of the enemy movements and maybe he just saw parliamentarian troops to his front he felt he could beat them and decided to go alone and do that and uh, paid the price so that was the first part of the battle it had gone really really badly for the royalists um, and to cut a very long story short on the left hand side um, having seen what was happening Lord Hopton decided to try and attack down that way, do a pincer movement, but that failed as well. They come up against a hot fire from behind hedges and there was some cavalry there, which again, they couldn't deploy their cavalry very well, but the, the parliamentarians seemingly could do easier. And in the end, uh, Hopton decided, I think with fourth agreement, that they would try and punch through the middle with their cavalry. And a massive cavalry battle took place when they finally did deploy in a position to be able to do something. There was a massive cavalry battle at the bottom of the slope. And apparently this cavalry battle lasted about three hours. It, it, it must have been various charges and then falling back in charges again. But the parliamentarians in a defended position with infantry support were able to cause a lot more casualties on the royalist cavalry than they took themselves. So in the end, the losses started to tell and um, both flanks started to fall back. And in the end, Hopton and Forth decided they'd lost a day and started a retreat towards Winchester. In fact, they ended up, uh, they retreated in good order because the, because the parliamentarians weren't in any position to follow them, really. Um, they retreated and in fact, they started going to Winchester but ended up going to Old Basie. So that was it, the battle was over, and it was a, it was a loss, a serious loss. And in fact, from then on, the Southwest um, was in parliamentarian hands. Eventually, uh, uh, over the next few weeks, they started to spread out a bit more. The London trains bands decided they would go home, which didn't help um, Waller's cause to um, take the South as quickly as he'd wanted to. He threatened Winchester, but without their support, they'd, all, they'd already gone home. They'd had enough of this. They went back to London. Um, he didn't have enough troops to uh, lay siege to Winchester. And although he burnt down apparently some of the barracks there, uh, he couldn't do much more. So it was a bit of a disaster. And it all happened when, for some reason, uh, Forth ordered, or supposedly, he denied he ordered it, but later on there were various... Um, um, witness accounts who said yes he did order an advance I think what he wanted to do was to to gently push the parliamentarians um, away from the road and, and, and hope to encourage their retreat but maybe Bard went too far maybe he couldn't see the enemy and once they got wiped out the royalists tried to retrieve the situation and things just got went from bad to worse the, the parliamentarians in a defended position were able to um, cause much more damage and casualties to the royalists than to themselves. So it all went sort of rather badly for the royalists in the end. And when I went to this battlefield, I, I could see more clearly the problems that um, commanders would have in the field as, in, on what seemed to be, if you try and play that as a war game, and in fact, we're going we're gonna, to, down the club tonight, we're going to play this game, we're going to have a Battle of Cheriton, and I'll put that on as a separate video, or, or if it's not very long, I might tag it on the end of this one, just to see whether we get the same result or not. We're going to be f fighting down a slope. We probably can't represent the slope very well on, on, a, on a war games table, but there will be lots of hedges, and it's going to be very difficult, I think, for the Royalists to, to win this. But we're going to give it a go and see, see if we get the same result 
and you'll see uh, say whether it's on the end of this video or whether it's another video I do um, you'll see the result right so thanks for listening for me waffling on about this this battle it's uh, just something I thought I would report back on and give you my opinion as to what I think happened and why I think the battle took place on, on the fields that uh, I've indicated rather than on the original idea um, that historians thought it was it was south of the um, north of the slope um, rather than south of it so there we go that's it for me stay safe and i'll see you all again soon